Babylon series. We are jumping into the book of Daniel. We've been actually walking in, through the book of Daniel, just trying to look at Daniel as an example for us. We, we've been journeying with Daniel. We realize that Daniel is not in the most favorable conditions, not the place that he would kind of draw up as a destination that he'd want to live out his days. And Daniel's in a foreign land, just like the video showed you, foreign gods, foreign culture, foreign food, foreign everything. Everything is different. For Daniel, But Daniel is a hallmark character in the Old Testament because Daniel seems to be, I mean, you could compare him to pretty much everybody. He's the most faithful biblical character in the Old Testament. I mean, he really is. And yet his circumstances are just dire. I mean, circumstances are not as he would have them to be. He is a faithful man in a foreign land. And we've been examining him and looking at him as an example because we made the case to you as we've journeyed through this series that we are in a foreign land. That, that is an American Christians, what's happening is American values and biblical values are moving away from each other. Now, I mentioned last week, we can argue the pace, we can argue the distance, but I don't think anybody is going to argue that they are one and the same. There is a distance. How far that is, how fast it's moving, that's maybe a matter of opinion, but saying that there's a distance, I think everybody agrees on. And so as followers of Jesus Christ, how do we live in our foreign land? How do we live in America? How do we live faithfully to the things of God when the world around us is drastically changing? And the question I want to ask is this. I want to ask this question as we try to live faithfully in our foreign land. When things are not going the way we want, Right? When, when, when sin is being praised, when righteousness is being ridiculed, when the distance between American values and biblical values is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, who do we point the finger at first? Right? Who do we blame first? Anytime there's a problem or there's a, there's a mess to be, to be cleaned up or anytime the, the way things are not as they should be, we point the finger at somebody. So my question this morning, as faithful followers of Jesus Christ, as American values and biblical values are finding themselves in further distance, who do we point the finger at first? The Republicans, right? The Democrats. Nobody laughed at that one. The Socialists, right? My parents' generation, Okay, I'll be my kids' generation. That'll make you feel a little bit better, <laughs> right? The Russians, whichever way Russia is. But do we ever point the finger this way? I remember when I was a kid, my aunt told me, Paul, every time you point the finger at somebody, you've got three fingers. Doing what? Pointing right back at you. You had the same aunt. Welcome to the family. And that may seem like a very elementary lesson, a very childish lesson, right? a lesson we teach to our kids. When you point the finger at somebody, there's three fingers pointing back at you. But I want to make the case this morning that that's a lesson we need to learn. That when we point the finger at everybody else, well, here, here's why we're in this mess. Here's why there's all this trouble. Here's why the world is the way it is. And we point out all the different people. My case to you this morning is not to say that we should never point the finger. I don't want you to hear that. But I think we should do something before we point the finger. I think what we should do is we should really point the finger at ourselves. I want you to take the pin out of the seat back in front of you. I want you to find that spot in your bulletin. First page uh, of your bulletin there, first internal page there, there's a box. It's the big idea box. I want you to write this one statement down, or maybe in your life group booklet as you're journaling uh, with us through a life group. We are, we are uh, pairing the, the different messages, so you're journeying with a, a group of people throughout those messages. So there's a box in your life group booklet. You can put this there as well. How do we live faithful in our foreign land, and how do we point the finger Here's, I think, the answer to that. Confess before you complain. Confess before you complain. Now, I'm not telling you not to complain. I'm not telling you to not point the finger. We should very much point out different evils and failings in this world, 100%. I think the Bible exhorts us and instructs us to do that. I think we've seen examples of Daniel doing that. 
he's called out different kings about their sin. I'm not telling you to not complain. Now, don't whine, right? But I'm not telling you to not complain, to not point out different evils and different failings. That's not what I'm saying. But I think we need to do something in tandem with that. And I'm going to argue prior to the complaining, we need to confess. And I want to show you this in an example of Daniel's life in Daniel chapter 9. For me, during this entire series, this has been the most convicting chapter and insightful chapter for me and the entire book of Daniel as I've studied through it this session. So jump with me, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. I want to show you this as Daniel is kind of at this pivotal moment in, in Israelite history. And as he gets to this moment, he feels that the paramount thing to do is not to point the finger anywhere else, it's not to complain, but it's to confess. Okay, let me show you this, Daniel chapter 9. We're going to start kind of halfway, I guess, through verse, we'll start with verse 2. Halfway through verse 2, it says, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. What is he talking about here? Here's what he's talking about. We know Daniel is a man of deep devotion. We know that. He's reading God's word. He's reading the prophet Jeremiah. He says of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is getting words from God. So he doesn't see Jeremiah as just somebody who knows some things, as, as somebody who is wise, as maybe a spiritual mentor. No, he's saying when Jeremiah speaks, God is speaking through Jeremiah. He has the authority of God. He speaks the truth of God. And he says, as God is speaking through Jeremiah, and Daniel's saying, I'm reading this, and I see that our time is almost up. See, at this point, Daniel is old. He's been in Babylon for just shy of 70 years. He's probably at like 68 years at this point. So he was taken from captivity as a young boy. And Jeremiah first spoke about them coming back when Daniel was a young boy, when Daniel was probably a teenager, probably in 605 B.C. So when Daniel was a really young boy, when he was taken captive, moved out of his homeland, pushed into exile to live under Babylonian rule, to serve under the kings, he had this in mind. Jeremiah told us that this was only last 70 years. Well, now that he's reading it in his daily devotion, it's popped up on his iPhone. Hey, reminder, read Jeremiah 29. He sees it and he reads it. And as he's reading it, he's thinking to himself, wait a second. He starts doing the math. He starts flipping the calendar. He starts looking through all his Facebook memories. How many birthdays have passed? And he realizes, wait, we're, we're there. Like our punishment is about to be over. Right, look at Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29, verse 10. This is what Daniel is reading. Think about this. This is just crazy to think about. Thousands of years ago, Daniel, this prophet, this faithful man in a foreign land, is reading what we're going to read together. Isn't that just remarkable? It kind of blows me away sometimes when I read the Bible that people have been reading this thing for thousands of years. It's remarkable. This is what Daniel is reading in Babylon as he prepares his heart for his people to come back to their land. This is what he reads. Jeremiah 29, look at verse 10. It says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not evil, to give you a fortune and a, and a hope. Then you will call upon me, and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Now notice what's happening there. Daniel is reading this, and what does he read? God's about to move, but he also reads what? God is expecting his people to move. Do you see how he says there in this promise? He says, you're going to seek me and you're going to find me. You're going to call my name and I'm going to answer. You're going to pray and I'm going to show up. So what does Daniel do? He sees this promise 
He knows the days are coming. He knows he's at the pinnacle of deliverance, of being brought back. So what does he do? He prays. Now, in his prayer, this is what I want us to see. What is he going to do? Is he going to complain or is he going to confess? What are his prayers going to be? Now, remember, I have made the case to you throughout this entire series that Daniel is a man of great character, that Daniel is incredibly faithful, that Daniel has hardly done anything wrong. We can't find a time where his sin is documented. And it's not like the Bible is shy of those things. Biblical authors all the time humiliate themselves by sharing details of their failures. Daniel, you can't find it. But look at the prayer that Daniel is about to pray. He feels he's fulfilling prophecy in a sense. God has said this is going to be over. He said, seek me and I will answer and I will bring you back. So Daniel's saying, I'm going to be the actor. I'm going to play a role. I'm going to be the one who seeks God's face. I'm going to be the one who prays and then God answers and he brings us back. Look at verse 3. It says, then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commands. Stop here. How does he start his prayer? He says, God, this is who you are. You keep your promise. Just notice this, because I think this is naturally what I tend to not do, and maybe naturally what you tend not to do. When things aren't going our way, when there's a mess, when there's trouble, who gets the blame first? It's not the Russians. God does. Think about it. Just, just, just roll back some film in your head of your experience. When you felt like you were in the pressure cooker of life, who do you point the finger at normally? Who are you tempted to? God, what are you doing? Why would you let this happen? Our, our greatest pains spiritually, we usually point the finger at God. What does Daniel do? Daniel draws attention to God. But what does he say? It's not your fault. This mess, it's not your fault. You keep your promises. When you say you'll do something, you'll do something. You are faithful to us. You are powerful, you are strong, and you are faithful. Then Daniel looks at himself, looks at his people, right? Look at verse five. We, now I'm gonna read through kind of the entire confession just because I want you to get the feel of it, okay? So I'm gonna read a lot of verses here. Read about 10 verses, okay? But, but hear Daniel's heart here. We have sinned and done wrong acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophet, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. As at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all of Israel, those who are near and those who are far away in the lands of which you have driven them because of the treachery that you have committed against, uh, we have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame. To our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord, our God, belong mercy and forgiveness. We have rebelled against you. And have not obeyed the voice of our Lord, the Lord our God, by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servant, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your laws and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and the oath that you written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against you. He has confirmed his word, which he spoke against us and against our, ruler, our rulers who ruled us by bringing us upon us the great, this great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquity and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all of his works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice." And now, O Lord, you brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. 
Man, I mean, that's intense. What is Daniel doing? He's saying, first and foremost, we've all sinned. I mean, he makes this point abundantly clear. Just, just look down at your Bible. Look at verse 7. He, he includes, well, verse 6. He includes every, everybody, our kings, our princes, our fathers, all the peoples of the land. Verse 7, Judah, Jerusalem, all of Israel, north and south. He says, those who are near, those who are far away. He even mentions their fathers. So he's saying past, present, future, every class of human being, everybody has sinned. That's what he's saying. All of us. Very similar to what Paul would write when he would write to the church at Rome and he would say, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, no, not one. Who's a part of this confession that Daniel is making now? Everybody. Absolutely everybody. Young, old, it seems even past, right? Those that have passed away. Every class, whether it be of high authority or low authority, Everybody, everybody, except for God. Do you see this? As he really kind of just lays out in, in kind of exaggerating detail the sin of his people, he mentions the character of God. And what does he do? The same way he started. There's nothing he could say against God. But look, look, at verse, look at verse seven. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame. You're right. We're wrong. I think there's a part of this dynamic that one helps the other here. It's almost a domino effect here. As he has started out with kind of adoration, God, this is who you are. You are the covenant keeper. You are the promise keeper. You're the one who says you're going to do something and you do it. You're holy, you're righteous, and you're pure. Righteousness belongs to you. Later on, I think it's verse 9, mercy and forgiveness belong to you. What is he doing? He is elevating his view to God, and as he elevates his view to God, what does that do to his view of his corporate we, to the people of Israel? He sees them for who they really are. He's saying, when I look up and I acknowledge and I truly comprehend the greatness and the glory of God, the righteousness of God, when I look down and I see my people, when I look down and see me, right, when I stare in the mirror, I'm not that impressed. Right, because being impressed is all about who, what's the competition, right? Who are you comparing yourself to? Well, if your competition for righteousness is God, if your comparison, your standard is the holy God of Israel, there's no way you win. And in fact, even those things you would call weaknesses that well, what everybody has now become these glaring spots of iniquity. That's what Daniel is saying. I look up and I see who you are and I look down and I see that we failed you. All of us have. Every single one of us, we're all to blame. This mess is our mess. Not your mess, God. It's our mess. And what does he say? It's just. We knew this was coming. You notice in his confession there, he references the law of Moses. What is that? Before the people ever got into the promised land, we're talking hundreds, hundreds of years before Daniel would ever write this, before they would ever go back to the land. When God first delivered them out of Egypt and they're going to the promised land, Moses, this great commander, great leader, God used to defeat Egypt, to, to, to humble Pharaoh, this great leader didn't make it to the promised land. He died right before he got there. But his kind of last sermon is the book of Deuteronomy. It's one of the early books in the Bible. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28, he goes to all the people and he says, guys, you got to listen to me. If you want to stay where we are, if you want to have good crops, if you want to have a ton of kids, if you want to enjoy this land, if you want everything that God has promised you, you got to obey. If you don't follow God, the land won't work. If you don't follow God, this is not going to happen. If you don't stay true to being a godly nation, then God will forsake you. And in fact, here's what God will do. He'll take his hand of protection off of you, and he will send invading armies to come capture you and rip you away from the land. 
In the book of Leviticus, it says that the land, as you're ripped away from it, will find a time of rest. It calls it a Sabbath. You think of Sabbath as kind of the seventh day, God rested in creation, right? But now he's saying, no, I'm going to rip away my people because they're so wicked and their sin has kind of got this concrete reality to it in the Old Testament that it's like polluting the ground that they're even standing on. And God says, no. I'm going to recycle, reduce, reuse, right? I'm going to push you out of the land. God is very green in a sense, right? I'm going to pull you out of the land, and I'm going to let this land rest for 70 years. You can't touch it because you messed it all up. And I, I, I'm not going to step into this wasteland that you've made of sin. So I'm not going to meet with you on this land, so you got to go. you got to leave. And for 70 years, the land has rest. And the people of God are broken to repentance, at least if they mimic the heart of Daniel. Daniel says, it's our fault. We knew this was coming. We knew this was coming, and we broke your covenant anyways. You warned us. You told us. It wasn't like this was a surprise. We knew the speed limit. So when you write the ticket, it's appropriate. God, we've broken your rules, and every single one of us has. Now, here's the part that I really find hard to swallow. As hard as he is on sin, I think he's just unfair to himself. I mean, this is Daniel here. <laughs> you haven't done all these things, Daniel. So I remember when I first read this, like, I don't know if it's just I've grown this attachment to Daniel, like as a character. Like, I feel like him and I are like friends now. Like, we have matching T-shirts that have like a broken heart, and it's like BFFs, and like you, we stand together, and you know. Like, I, I just feel this, like, kindred spirit with Daniel. I just really, I really like the guy. So as he's doing his confession, I'm like, no, it's not, that, you're not that bad. So I remember first reading, I'm like, I know what he's doing. Here's what he's doing. What he's doing is he's using this kind of, like, royal we, right? He's just speaking as a representative of his people. Uh, like, for instance, like, I, I could say something like, man, we're going to win the NBA championship. I mean, did you see the Lakers last night? I mean, did you see us? Did, any, did you see it? This is an open question here. Did anybody watch the Lakers? Good golly. You know we have Anthony Davis and LeBron James, right? Like, you know we're going to be really good. We've been in a wilderness wandering, but 70 years, the land has rested. And there's a Sabbath in L.A. Staples Center, and we are about to come back. Ooh, and Kawhi is about to cry. It's going to be awesome. Make a T-shirt of that. It's going to be good, okay? Right? But I'm, you're watching that, and part of you, if you're a Laker fan, you're like, we're going to win this. Now, stop. Has LeBron James ever passed the ball to Paul Crandall? No, I don't even think I could catch it. <laughs> he probably passed it and hit me in the head, break my glasses. Like, there is no we. There is no we to winning the NBA Finals. There's no we. I don't even go to the games. I can't afford it. That's crazy, right? I cheer for my television. But, but I have that sense of like almost a representative we, like LA, right? We represent. So that's what I'm reading this. I'm like, that's what Daniel's doing. I, he's a good guy. He's just saying they're, they're all messed up. What am I really doing there? And I, I'm trying to make the case that Daniel is pointing this way. But is he doing that? I think in some sense, yes. I think in some sense he is saying we. I think in another sense he is saying me. All right, look at verse 20. As he describes, after he's done with this confession, he kind of lists everything out. Then he's going to make a, a, an appeal to God, and we'll get to that. But look at how he describes this whole prayerful interaction that he's had with God. And, and just ask yourself, does he use we language or does he use me language? Okay, I think we're going to find he uses me language. Verse 20, while I was speaking and praying, confessing, what's that word? My sin. Not our sin, not their sin. What do you say? My sin. Confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God. This is a me thing, but it's a we thing. And look at what his question is. Look at verse, or his petition is, his request is verse 16. O oh Lord, according to your righteousness, according to your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sin and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people. 
have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, our, O oh, our Lord, listen to the plea or prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. Notice what he says there. It says, for your own sake. Just look right there. What did you say? God, we have no resume to give to you to accredit your favor. We need mercy. Do you notice his confession is not said, but we're okay, we're decent. No, he's never given anything as a shred of evidence to be delivered to persuade the court to say not guilty. He's never said that. What is he calling for? Mercy before the court, right? I have no exhibit A, here's my righteousness. I have no reason, God, to bend your arm to say that you owe me. There is no owe, there is no what I deserve. God, if we're gonna get back to the land, it is only by your mercy, he makes this even clear. Your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. Verse 18. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes to see our desolation in the city that is called by your name. For we are not present, or we do not pre present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. What is he saying there? I've got nothing to show. So God, just be merciful to us. And then, then, then what does he say? He says, for your own sake, that's that first verse we read, verse 17, for your own sake. So God, I have no reason, no resume to credit me anything of blessing from you. I have nothing. And even when you give your blessing, it's not for me. It's not for my reputation. It's not for my esteem. It's not for my worth. What does he say? It's for your sake, God, for your glory. What is Daniel saying there? My reputation, Paul Crandall's reputation, not having a Christian church's reputation, your reputation, Israel's reputation is not a battle that God is interested in fighting. There is one name and one reputation that he's, he's thinking about. And what is that? His own. For my glory, not for your fame, not so people will look at you, but the only reason we can ask God to be merciful is for his sake, for his glory, for his renown, for his fame, and not for Paul's, and not for yours. So what does God do? God sees this broken Daniel praying for his people. A promise is getting to the end. These two things coincide, God's plan and Daniel's prayer, and God delivers, God restores. He brings the people back. They go into Jerusalem. They rebuild the city. They rebuild the temple. Things are great. Now, what does that mean for us, though? What does that mean for us as American Christians? Okay, this is where it gets a little bit tricky because we cannot thrust ourselves and just drop ourselves into the story of Daniel as if we are Daniel because we're not Daniel. Now, there's something we can learn from this, but we need to learn a little bit about what is the lay of the land for Daniel, because there's a sense in which Daniel and the people of Israel are different than us. Here's the big difference. Israel is not America. Okay, there's a big shift and a move in the New Testament. Israel was God's nation. God was working with one nation, bringing people into that nation. To be a part of Israel was to be a part of the people of God. And if God was drawing people from all the nations, he was bringing them into Israel. And this Israel was a, was a theocracy, was a government ruled by God, set up by God. In the New Testament, things are different. God has now scattered his people. So now God has peoples among all the nations. America is not Israel, as in it's not God's nation. So if we're reading Old Testament passages and thinking everything that's true about Israel is true for America, we're comparing apples to oranges. We're making a categorical mistake. Israel had an obligation and they lost their land because they didn't meet those obligations. The American church has an obligation not to set up a theocracy, not to set up an, an Israel of modern day, but the church has an obligation. And what is our obligation? To be salt. To be light. That's what Jesus told us to do. But to make the world around us better. To be a positive influence. To promote godly things. To promote godliness. To be a witness of the great love of God. Israel had an obligation that they did not meet. 
and consequence fell on them. The American church, we have an obligation. Okay, so here's my question. Have we met that obligation? If we are to be light to the world and the world is getting darker, is it strange to think that part of the blame falls on us? If we are supposed to be the salt of the earth and the world's not very tasty or pleasing anymore, is it strange to think that some of the blame lies on us? Have we as the American church been a beacon of gospel love to the world? Have we shown them at the very foundation of human society that our marriages are commitments of love, commitments that endure, commitments that go through all the hardship, all the struggle, all of the trial, all of the wounds, all of the scars, that, that yes, we have messy marriages. We have messy marriages that are founded on the mercy of God, and we pursue with the persistence of God, because to say, I break my covenant, is to make a wrong image to the God who never breaks his covenant. So when the, the, the church shows its marriages, are they showing anything different than what the world has. You know the statistics. Like, let's just be honest. We know them. We're embarrassed by them. Our divorce rate is a little bit better. And by a little, I mean some small percentage point. Can we say that we fulfilled the obligation of being great witnesses to our America? to our country, that God has put us here, and we're like, God, if we were to stand before you, the glorious judge of the universe, and you were to ask every single Christian in America, have you been salt? Have you been light? Have you protected your witness? Have you let the ambitions of the world invade your mind and let the American dream sour you to a covetous heart that's envious, ambitious, and willing to move everybody aside to gain a profit? Do they see Christ-likeness coming out of you or capitalistic values coming out of you? Do they see fidelity? Do they see monogamy? Do they see respect? Do they see honor? Do they see love? Do they see submission? Or do they see this independent view of happiness that says whatever I want is what I should get and I deserve everything that I want? Has the church invaded us or have we invaded them? I'm sorry, has the world invaded the church or have we invaded them? How, who is setting the temperature? Are we totally missing our obligation? Would God look at us as if he looked at Israel and said, you know what, American church? This land needs a rest from you because you have not protected me. You have not protected my witness. You have not kept marriages if I have instructed you to. You have not esteemed people the right way. You have victimized people. You are championing things that hurt other people. You have, let, you have let the world invade my church. And you have not as a church invaded the world as I've asked you to do. Man, I'll tell you, there's a moment as I'm reading this, reading Daniel 9, and I know I'm not as good as Daniel. And I read his confession, and I think if Daniel had to do that, what does Paul Crandall have to do? What, what do we have to do? I want to invite you to do something. And this is weird. And this is strange. And it's totally out of your comfort zone. It's out of my comfort zone. I thought of the idea, and I didn't want to do it. Why? Why? Well, because I was just afraid, because it's awkward and it's strange. But as I thought about it more, and as I read through the passage more, and I was writing the message more, I just realized, this, we have to do this. I felt convicted that if I did not do this, that I want to be faithful as your pastor to the obligation that God has on me. I want to lead you in a confession. Not pointing the finger over here, Right, but seeing those three fingers that point right here. 
Now, I just want to tell you right up front, this is going to be awkward. It's going to be a little weird. It's going to be a little different. But I think God's going to smile. And I think in order to serve you in a clear conscience, I needed to lead out in this. So here's what I want you to do, church. I want you to join me in a me and a we confession. We're going to look at the commandments of God, and we're going to ask ourselves if we've broken them. And we're going to confess that we have broken them. But I want you to join me in this. Not only make this a confession for you personally, but for us corporately as the American church. I want you, if you can, I want you to imagine that Paul's not even on the stage, that you are standing before the glorious judge of the universe, your maker, your creator, the one who sustains you and continues to give you life. You're standing before him. And he has asked you about your obligation to the land that you're in to be salt and to be light. And I'm going to ask you with courage and a little bit of shame to confess to him that we have not met that obligation. So here's how we're going to do this. I want to invite you to stand with me. Will you stand? And I want to invite you to do this. I have framed this confession after the Ten Commandments. I'm going to read a portion of it. And I want you, just in the silence of your own mind, to read those portions that are on the screen and just make that a part of this is a me confession, this is a we confession. At the bottom of the slide, there's going to be a little yellow and underlined portion. That's what you're going to say vocally out loud. Now, if you don't want to say it, that's fine, okay? So let me release you of that. I want to invite you to confess it, though. And I think God will smile on us in this moment as we confess our sin before him. I know this is weird. We've never done anything like this before. So we're going to step into this kind of new thing together. So again, I'm going to read. Let me read. When you see the underlying portion that will also be in yellow, I'll gesture my hand toward you. And if you feel comfortable and if you feel convicted and you need to confess that, then I invite you to confess that out loud. Let's walk into this. Holy and righteous God, we confess like Daniel. We have broken your laws. We are guilty of pride, unbelief, self-centeredness, and idolatry. Bring our hearts to see the severity of our sin and the glory of your righteousness as we now acknowledge our sin in your holy presence. We have worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. We have sought satisfaction in this world's pleasures rather than in you. We have loved to praise our own glory more than yours. We have had other gods before you. We have prayed religious prayers to impress others. We have uttered your name countless times without reverence or fear, or sorry, or love. We have listened to others use your name in vain without grieving. We have taken your name in vain. We have often destroyed our neighbor with our tongues. We have been quick to judge others. We have considered revenge when we've sinned against you. We have murdered in our hearts. We have loved temptation rather than fighting it. We have lusted after unlawful and immoral pleasures. We have justified our lusts by using the world as our standard. We have committed adultery with our eyes. Our lives overflow with discontent, ungratefulness, and envy. We have complained in the midst of your abundant provision. We have sought to exalt ourselves through owning more. We have stolen what is not ours and coveted what belongs to others. We have told distorted truths, half-truths, and untruths. We have despised the truth to make ourselves look better. Even in our confession, we look for ways to hide our guilt. We have lied to you and to others. Oh God, we have sinned against your mercy. We, have ashamed, we are ashamed to lift up our faces before you. 
Our iniquities have gone over our heads. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquity, O Lord, who would stand? How shall we answer you? We lay our hands on our mouths. We have no answer to your righteous wrath and your just judgment. We have no answer. But God himself has mercifully provided an answer for us. Church, hear this. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Say that with me. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We all know there is no answer, no answer for our sin that we can provide, but God has graciously provided that where? Right here symbolized in this meal that Jesus Christ died and rose again. And as we participate in symbols, we participate by faith that Jesus Christ is our only answer for our sin. Church, pray with me. Father, we love you, and we thank you for who you are to us in Jesus Christ. God, thank you, thank you, thank you for your mercy. God, if the world around us is waiting to be impressed by us, they'll be waiting forever. Our righteous resume does not match up. It's not persuasive enough. It doesn't pull or influence or draw. It doesn't do what we would like it to do. But God, what is most compelling about Christianity, what is most compelling about what the scriptures say, what is most compelling at the faith of Daniel, the faith of ours, is that we confess that there is a righteousness that is not ours, and that righteousness is persuasive. That righteousness moves. That righteousness influences. That's the righteousness that appeases you, God, the righteousness of Jesus Christ that he died and he rose again and now hands us this righteousness and says, be clothed in it, put it on. You don't call us out and say, perform. You say, put on my righteousness and watch how it changes you. Father, I pray not only for us, not only for me, but for American Christianity. Father, will we be known more by our confession than our complaints. We are known for our complaints. God, are we known for our confession? What unleashes the righteousness of Christ to the world? It's when the church confesses that we need it. God, help us, help us to be obedient to your obligation, to be a light, a light that shines not on ourselves, but shines its focus on Jesus Christ. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may have a seat.